December, I'm just going to be taking it easy. I mean, I can cut firewood, but I have a schedule. I no longer am tied to that market, uh, uh, the, har the harvest planning, harvest marketing schedule anymore. So we like not having the greenhouses in production during the, during the winter. What we can do is uh, plant at the end of the season, and I'll start pretty much at the end of our market season. In, in November, we, uh, in November, late November, early December, we can start planting our greenhouses. But before we do that, we pull out all the old plants that were in there for the year and have the crew come in with buckets of compost and pour them on the bed. And we have a, the smallest uh, uh, rototiller that Toyville makes. Uh, and we chill uh, that compost in, into the bed. So that's the only fertility we give it each year. We do that once every fall. Uh, and then we plant spinach or uh, spicy greens, lettuce, carrots, beet greens, all fairly early in the season, but because none of the greenhouses are heated during the winter, uh, by end of December, early January, maybe the end of January, they start to sprout. They, you know, they start to come up. Uh, and what we're looking for is only no further than the first seed leaf production. Uh, by the time this time of year turns around, when they start to really you know, heat up inside and growth starts. Because we've discovered that um, if we, if we uh, mismanage by putting, uh, you know, by pushing things too fast, and we can't push things too fast, we used to grow lettuce and radishes and spinach in our heated greenhouse, which we only heat about, starting about this time of year, but they grow so fast, they've already been planted, right, but as soon as you start heating it, they suddenly, growth spurt really takes off, and then we have uh, crops that are ready before our markets are ready. And that's, that's a mistake. <laughs> uh, so we, just, we don't do that anymore. We plant all those crops I mentioned in unheated greenhouses so we don't have that problem. And in the heated greenhouse, we do the beet greens and the carrots and, and the uh, summer turnips because they're, they're going to not, not bolt uh, nearly as quickly. Uh, and they're they, uh, they a little less cold tolerant, so they do appreciate the, uh, the warmer weather. Um, in our greenhouses, we have uh, Three of our greenhouses are regular metal bowls of different sizes, but uh, it's a basic commercial greenhouse. And one of them we still have is a, a one we built ourselves out of uh, uh, spruce and cedar poles so we just cut out of our woods. Uh, we, we placed you know, rocks in a row, and on top of that we put a sill, a large pole of, of, of spruce or cedar. Um, and then if we have, since the greenhouse is longer than our trees, we, we put the butts of the trees at the end and then overlap the tops of the trees and then bolt, uh, nail those together so we get that small soil. And then we put verticals on that and brace them like crazy and then uh, just sort of make a, 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 a frame like that. And the advantage of that is it's, it's basically made up of a lot of small panels, about six by six. So when we take the greenhouse off our, take the plastic off our, uh, commercial greenhouses, which is one big sheet, but by the time we take it off, it's got tears in here and there, or abrasions, uh, but it's still, in between, it's still good, so we can cut that into sections and put that onto our uh, wooden greenhouse. Um, uh, uh, we use uh, old drip tape for batten tape on the old greenhouse, so once you've got a, once you've used drip tape for a few years, you've got lots of drip tape that uh, doesn't drip so well anymore, so uh, we find that it makes excellent batten tape, lasts for years and years. Uh, you got to use the longest staples you can find, though. The 916 steel file staples work pretty well because they, they have to go into the screws or cedar, and you don't want to pull it out. Um, so that, that's one of the techniques we use. Um, let's see, we mulch our greenhouses, which uh, we uh, have a weed whacker, and uh, well, during the summer, uh, all the fields around our gardens were mowing the hay, and you can bring that into the greenhouses, uh, usually in. Uh, mid-June to mid-July, and we mulch all the crops in there. But what crops are in there, back to my story of when we were planting the things, we, once, once this, everything starts to come up, and we're about this time of year, we've got you know, the first true leaves on a lot of our plants. Uh, we start to heat one of the greenhouses, and that's where we start all of our own seedlings for our, our, our gardens. We have five acres of gardens. And we also sell seedlings at the farmer's market. So we, we want to start lots and lots of seedlings. And all of our aisles, we have we made these long, thin tables out of this, uh, uh, cedar and spruce poles uh, with drywall screws holding them together. Uh, and the tables are only about that high, but they're as wide as an aisle. And we fill up every other aisle with those tables to hold more plants, you know, trays of plants, because it's, it gets very crowded in there from end of April till the beginning of June. So when 
crop after another. Uh, so, uh, we'll, so but at the same time, we're also having to harvest our beds. So uh, we, uh, we have one bed, with the, one aisle, we can harvest beds on both sides, and the next aisle over on each side is full of those tables with seedlings on them. The, uh, when, when, the, when the carrots are, are starting to be harvested, or the turnips or uh, the spinach, we try to harvest them in little patches. Every once in a while we'll harvest a little patch real heavily. So we'll have all these little blank spots, and then we'll plant our cucumber seedlings, or cherry tomato seedlings, or tomato seedlings in those little patches. Meanwhile, the rest of the crop is still growing. The first crop, the, the, uh, the lettuce, spicy greens, radishes, spinach, uh, carrots, beet greens. They're, they're still growing, but in order to sort of <coughs> condense the, the time, we're putting in uh, the, our transplants in amongst those, and then having to tell the cutting crew to be very careful, don't harvest any of our tomato plants uh, when they're harvesting the lettuce. Uh, let's see. We, uh, oh yeah, one of the things we're thinking of doing, we've taken down two of our greenhouses, and we're thinking of converting our, our operation, because we use the greenhouse mostly for season extension and not for growing in the wintertime. Uh, we've, we've, we've been playing with those conduit hoops, where you take like a conduit and bend it into a hoop, so you've got a, a hoop that's like that big over your bed or two. We're thinking of that will work for us, for what we're doing, as well as the hoop houses will. So this year, uh, we just started playing with them last year. We found they did really well for late season extension on broccoli. The broccoli that we had under those did much better into late October, November than the broccoli right next to them in the wood cover. Um, so that's, so this spring we're going to be planting our field spinach and we're going to immediately cover it with that. You know, as soon as we plant, we're going to cover it with those. Uh, plastic goes over that and this, the plastic is just held down from the sandbags every few feet. Uh, so that's one of the techniques we're thinking of. Uh, and of course, the big advantage of those is, besides being cheap, is that once the spinach gets to a certain size and doesn't need those anymore, you can just, it takes about an hour for a hundred foot one, you can just move it over for about an hour, one person can do it. So you can put it onto another crop that's going to appreciate it more than the spinach. Uh, so, that, so if you had a hundred feet worth of it, then you could basically move that two or three times during the spring, uh, and then use it again in the fall for frost protection and, and you know, season extension in the fall. The big advantage of being able to move it is that you're able to, uh, to use that indoor technique. Not as good as the hoop house, but it's a lot better than even the, the, the wire, uh, the wire so that's most of the hands. Great. Any questions for Tom? Okay, we'll come back to you, Tom. Thanks. Meal farm, and uh, we grow um, 10 acres of mixed veggies, which uh, we sell primarily at farmers markets. And we have uh, three of these Ed Pearson greenhouses 26 by 96, and then we have a um, 27 by 48 hoop house, and um, the primary focus of our hoop house production has been to uh, provide salad, greens, spinach uh, from the first day of farmer's market, have it till the end of farmer's market, which used to be beginning of May, in October, then it was weekend before Thanksgiving. Now there's this new phenomena of the endless farmer's market, uh, <laughs> where the people are expecting you to come out all winter long. And one of our main markets, the Oro Market, goes twice a month outdoors through the winter. So we've sort of upped our uh, goal with that. So now we're shooting to have salad, spinach till the second Saturday of uh, January and then start again the second Saturday of March. Uh, and
And we're trying to do this without putting too much extra effort into it, like going out with bubble covers or anything like that. Um, so this is a heated greenhouse where we heat half of it, and then uh, the other half is unheated, and we have two of those. Um, and I'll just go back. I had wondered where I could put more greenhouses on my property because pretty much I had thought, well, they've got to be near the barnyard so that I can get to them very easily. And most of my flat barnyard area, if I put greenhouses up, I wouldn't have that view. And I didn't want to block that view. And then I realized, oh, I can put them as far away as I want. And so now we're going to start building them on this level piece of ground that's probably like a couple hundred yards away from the barnyard. But uh, overcoming that obstacle of not wanting to have the hoop house outside of the barnyard really uh, was uh, helpful for putting up more of these. Um, <coughs> if you haven't done any winter production, the easiest thing to do, and the first thing we ever did, is to overwinter spinach. And you can pretty much plant that almost as late as you want. And it will, as long as it comes up, it'll survive the winter. And then when the light comes back in the spring, it'll take right off. Uh, and that is definitely the easiest thing. And the, the thing about overwintered spinach is that the flavor is, if you haven't had it, it's absolutely incredible. It's so sweet and uh, your customers will will be very pleased with it. So, I thought I was gonna have some really good pictures when I was asked to do this. Underneath those green tarps is all of our onions. And in our heated greenhouse, we fire that thing up the first week of March to germinate the onions. And I had kind of been feeling bad about all of the oil that we were burning in one week to start our onions. So two years ago, I had this idea, I should just build this giant germination chamber, and it's two layers of greenhouse benches piled up with 350 flats of onions piled up underneath there, and the heat's blowing underneath. And I was like, then I'll have three beds that I can grow spinach in and harvest it while the onions are germinating, and that'll be the first crop of spinach to bring to market. And it worked really good last year, and I think that was because it was so mild. This year it wasn't nearly as mild, and you can see that spinach didn't grow very much. That was probably planted the first week of December. I ended up cutting those two beds because I had to, but I didn't get very much spinach. I got like 10 pounds of spinach out of those two beds. Um, but this next picture, this is spinach that had been planted in September in that same greenhouse and had actually been the very last spinach that we harvested in December for markets. And it had grown and taken right off by this time. And from two beds, where I told you I got 10 pounds, one bushel of that little baby stuff, from two beds we got eight bushels off of that. And what that made me realize was I should do that last spinach in the heated part of the greenhouse, pick it in December, and then for some reason, because those plants are that much further along, I mean, there was a huge difference. You can see the difference in how much they grew. Um, there was a lot more spinach to pick there. Uh, and this, you know, it, it doesn't look that great because it's kind of been hanging out all winter. It was perfect spinach in the fall, but there was a ton of beautiful spinach that came out of that, and it's kind of just a bonus crop. And so now, it used to be when market started in May, we would actually wait to plant this end of the greenhouse because we wanted to have the salad start at the beginning of May. The reality is we could have started earlier. So now we start to plant this right off uh, to get salad as quickly as possible. So we harvested spinach and we started digging beds. Uh, even little kids who hate vegetables would like to overwood and spinach. Point of that picture. Um, bed prep. Tom was talking about the auto teller. For quite a number of years, we've had the last year's salad greens grow up into these enormous plants. 
And one option would be, I suppose, to mow it, pull it all out. I got very sadistic and decided that we should double dig all of our beds and bury the residue underneath. I don't know if you know the French intensive double dig. So we fork all of our beds, and for the past three years, we've actually double dug them. So we've dug down, forked underneath, and uh, it's a very good workout. Um, it really gets you going in the spring. This is a bed of salad planted in the heated greenhouse. Kind of a confusing thought because we're always changing things. But, um, you know, one idea if you're going to set up some heated space for a greenhouse to raise seedlings, make it more than what you need. You know, eventually you might grow into it with your seedlings and or you'll have a nice space to grow some salad for yourself. Uh, this is the far end of the greenhouse with some of the earliest seedings of salad. We pretty much, we plant our salad like we do in the field. We put it into rows. Uh, we have weed problems in our greenhouses, and so we need to be able to get in there and, and weed them. And also, I feel like if you do it too dense, there's not a lot of airflow around the plants, and it seems like the disease issues are a little less planted in rows like that. But it's the same as what Adam was talking about. It's a bed of lettuce, and then a week later, it's a bed of mustard. Uh, we don't go crazy with all the different types of things you could do. You know, the people are pretty happy to just have fresh salad. <coughs> you couldn't normally get it. So you get an earlier crop, you get a later crop, and in these hoop houses, you can also get better crops. And that would definitely be true for tomatoes and peppers. And this is in the same fence where you saw the salad. We don't necessarily get ours quite as early as you could because usually we have salad that we're cutting. And even though we could have planted the tomatoes, we're cutting the salad, we've tried interplanting and all that. Now I think we'll start being able to put the tomatoes in earlier because we have more hoop houses or we shoot for earlier production. But your tomatoes are always going to be a little earlier and they tend to be a lot nicer um, in the hoop house. There's a lot less late blight concern if late blight continues being a problem. Peppers, uh, we can't, we don't seem to be able to ripen orange peppers out in the field, but I really love the look of an orange pepper. And so we grow all orange peppers in the hoop house. And then we can have like really nice orange peppers and we throw them in with the red peppers and people think you're awesome because you have <laughs> beautiful orange peppers. Um, one of the things that we're trying to figure out is, well, we want all this greenhouse space so we can have all these greens for the people who want to go to farmer's market all winter long. But then we gotta figure out things to do with them in the summer. And we have started having more and more disease problems because there's this tendency to raise a lot of tomatoes and peppers in the greenhouses. Um, and so we're trying to overcome that. And this isn't really a clear picture, but there's some zucchini. And I heard something about zucchini not being top dollar, but, um, you know, you could actually get quite a bit of zucchini from a bed in a greenhouse, and you could sell it very early. And so I've always been pretty impressed with, with the amount of zucchini that we've sold those first couple weeks before the field zucchini starts. Um, whether or not it's worth it, I don't know, except for I know that just as a little story, which I like to tell stories, it's really easy for the zucchini to get away from you in there. And when you start picking out in the field, it's really easy to forget that you still have some zucchini in the greenhouse. <laughs> and Benji comes and tells me, because we had forgotten, he said, oh, all the zucchini was giant. I left it, I cut it and put it right in the path. And I was like, oh, okay. Next morning, the guy calls up, I need 200 pounds of the biggest zucchini you've got. <laughs> I said, hold on a second, let me go look. <laughs> and look at all, I had 200 pounds of zucchini sitting on the ground. <laughs> and I said, sure, I'll, I'll have it for you this afternoon. <laughs> and he was like, 70 cents a 
principality to you. Uh, I have no idea if it's worth it or not. So here's so heirloom tomatoes. Heirloom tomatoes do really nice in the greenhouses. One of the things about this picture is these two beds. I don't even think I can raise tomatoes and peppers in those two beds anymore because the plants just totally succumb to some disease which I should probably plant some tomatoes and peppers in it and bring and get identified <laughs> so that I know what it is. But uh, in fact, this whole hoop house has apparently had too much tomato and pepper and it's not seeming to work so we're looking for new crops. And in the background, I think I have a picture there's peppers, and these are, that picture was from when Pepper actually grew in that house. And we were kind of on the every other year. Hot peppers, habaneros, you know, they wouldn't do squat in, uh, out in our field, but they will grow into bushes this big and just be loaded with habanero peppers. I don't know if it's really worth it, but, you know, the young kids who come and they want to be, Tough and cool, they will find out the yellow pepper, and like, hey, but be careful. Uh, it's on the ground fair, it's pretty funny. <laughs> it's, it's almost like a drug. I mean, they're like, they go back. <laughs> all their friends are looking at it. It probably should be illegal to sell it to them. Uh, pole beans. Probably you could do pole beans out in the field just fine. But it's very convenient to trellis them because of the uh, overhead <coughs> cross ties. And pole beans are really much better eating than mush beans. And people really notice that. And uh, you know, we've grown the flat ones and the, and the round ones, and they're really long. And you can actually, from 100 feet, you can get quite a few bushels. And the friggin' plants will grow so tall that you'll have to put your kid on your shoulders while you're standing on a pocket. So that we can pick up. Which we do. <laughs> and, uh, but they're, they're good, they're nice, and people appreciate the whole thing. And they grow good green apples in all pictures. <laughs> short years of farming experience, you know, you've got to rotate crops, especially in an organic system. Great question. Let's make the question short. Try to remember that you asked that question, I'll come back to you. Uh, the seasonal greenhouses versus kind of more permanent uh, all year. Oh, okay, yep. Yeah. Or temporary greenhouses, what you mean. Sure, yeah. yeah. Like roll the plastic up. Right, like a caterpillar. Washing the, uh, okay, yeah. 
Why don't we put that with sanitation? Sanitation. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we'll do it all together. It's cleaning up the place. Yeah, Jack. Something other than plants and production. So, raising chickens in there, fishing, birds. Irrigating. sit in a stream and pump water. Under the the ramp ramp pump. Ramp, yes, the ramp pump. Hydraulic ramp pump. And NRCS used to provide money for that back in the old days. stop there. I think we're going to fill the afternoon with this list, and if we don't, we can make the list longer. Um, crop rotation in a greenhouse. I'm going to start with this one because this is an interesting one. Giacco here? Yeah. yeah, this is an interesting one from certification standards as well. Uh, NOP certification standards say that you have to have a crop rotation in your vegetable production. We've sort of been wrestling with what to do with hoop houses. If you only have one, and tomatoes are by far the most profitable crop, tomatoes year after year, there's going to be problems, and you're not meeting that rotation. So uh, let's start with um, you guys. Are you either rotating into your houses? Yeah, uh, cucumbers, uh, tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, and peppers. So you got four crops and two families. Yeah, that's great. And but you have to, and you never pull it out to go into a cover crop. And leave that valuable land in fallow. No. Uh, I plan to once we have enough greenhouses, but uh, one thing that 
I'll probably start doing is, uh, and I've done it once, is the year before going into uh, putting on new plastic, taking the old plastic off and treating it more like a 2,000 foot field, growing something totally different. Like one year we had, it's not that much different, we had a shower outside all summer. We actually planted it underneath the plastic, but then pulled the plastic off, left it yeah. all summer. Um, but in the heated greenhouse, and I've done this once, and this year's gonna be the second time, we've flipped the sides that we raised the seedlings on, so the greenhouse is divided in half. And uh, the first time we did it, it worked like a charm. And my thinking was that the sort of every day, three times a day watering that we were doing on the greenhouse benches would help to leach out some of the salts that accumulated in the greenhouse. So we moved all the tomatoes and pepper seedlings down to the far end and dug up underneath the benches, which I thought, well, maybe I bet that's got some good That's a great it. idea. And those plants were just out of control with how dark green they were yeah. and tall, the tomatoes. But the, and that, so that seemed like in that heated house, sort of the best thing we were ever going to do for rotation was to switch sides of where we raised our seedlings. Adam, are you doing any rotations on, on the farm? Yeah, so we do at home. That was part of the reason why we bought this movable one is that now we've got you know, the movable one. It'll be all tomatoes this year. <laughs> next year it'll be all tomatoes, but it'll be in the next spot. And then we'll move into the bigger one, which is you know, half of that will then be tomatoes, and then the other half will be tomatoes. So we'll kind of have a four-year rotation, and then, you know, good with that, the same kind of cucumbers adds a nice one. We do sweet potatoes as another family in there. Um, and then I think something that's really helpful, if you have the market for it, that can really help with rotation is cut flowers. Mm -hmm. But you gotta have the market for it. And, but that, your family options just kind of open. So. Um. Eric, one thing we discovered on the farm where I work is that, uh, and I've worked with Yonko about this, is uh, we have three plant houses. One of them is our um, not movable, and two of them are movable. And for the movable houses, we have three positions for each house. And we started talking about documentation and the Mosca paperwork. And do we follow the high tunnel, or do we follow the plot? You know, in terms of the annual documentation. Yeah, and, and what did Yako say? Well, actually, it was part with Yako and then part with our latest inspector, who um, I can't remember her name, but she's English. Um, and she was great. And uh, we decided that uh, uh, we really needed to follow the plot itself. That's and, a, I um, agree with that. And Good. to not worry about where the actual plastic is, because we move our um, plant houses, we move the hoops twice a year. Yeah, yeah, and, that's um, great. Do you have a cover crop? Um, we do, yeah. yeah. And did you find the farm manager you were looking for? Uh, uh, more or less. Okay. Yeah. I was going to make an announcement to me. <laughs> <laughs> Other comments? Lisa, are you rotating around at all? In the hoops? Um, we do a lot of um, mustards in the winter, and then I alternate. Um, and it's the, same, it's the same bed every year, but I alternate tomato and pepper. Tomato and pepper, so I get more hair flow. Mm -hmm. Anybody, uh, anybody doing interesting rotation with their hoop houses? I, I know some people actually wrote, to, somebody asked about chickens. I, I knew somebody who rotated chickens. They would do chickens one year and crops the next year. David, you're doing some rotations. Yeah, basically, it's like Lisa's saying, it's tomatoes or peppers or basil with interspersed with greens. So greens half the year and tomatoes half the year. And Mm -hmm. And do you ever go a year without tomatoes? Wait. Yeah. Basil's a good one. Yeah. You know, it's, the, the nice thing about basil is it's, it's definitely going to come earlier than your field basil, and people are probably going to buy it all up. And you can pull it out earlier and be done with it, and then do something early for a fall. Or walk between the tomatoes. Or 
walk between the tomatoes, but just get it out of the way. Yeah. You know, it tends to be done quicker. Yeah. We actually plant our peppers with basil. So we've got uh, a pepper plant and a basil plant, a pepper plant and a basil plant. We have double rows like that. So they're each, each, the peppers and the basil are each sort of zigzag down, down the bed. Oh, so you're in the they row, not alternating rows, but right. alternating plants. And in the they row. seem to like each other, even though they also seem to be crowded, but I know the peppers don't mind being crowded. And we, instead of pulling it out, we just leave them right in there. And the basil finally, so these are unheated greenhouses, and the basil will come before the peppers do to the, to the, cool. the cold weather as it comes in. So eventually you have peppers still there and the basil's all dead. Uh, so not for about a two week period. Nicholas, is that, that was your question, right? Yeah, I think the only other part, uh, I'm still skeptic. I mean, it's, I don't know, Dave, how long you've been in, a, or Lisa, you know, I just, I, in my plan, what I'm looking for is a, a further rotation, more than two families, even more than four years, and incorporating cover crops, particularly for soil structure, for, the, for building a physical structure, not just addressing the chemical needs or even just the biological needs. So yeah. I, I don't know if anyone's doing thinking of that. And I'm with you. I really think we should be able to do it with a cover crop in the rotation. Yeah. The problem is, and I'm sure everyone here agrees with it, is valuable space and it's hard to pull it out. But how, how sustainable is that going to be? You know? Wasn't there some comments from NLP about uh, houses and greenhouses that kind of didn't call for a full rotation but it had to do with monitoring disease and fertility and all of that? Because uh, if, if you're doing a good compost system, um, you're, you're doing as much as our hand man building is, and probably more in some ways than we're able to do cover crop in some fields, just yeah. because of the amount of tillage that's going on. And you just reminded me, actually, there's a farmer in Vermont who, instead of rotating the crop, rotates the soil. And what they do is they take out six inches or up to a foot of soil, once every two or three years, they just remove that from the house and they bring in new compost and soil mix. That's an interesting rotation. <laughs> Bruce. Yeah, good point, Bruce. Thank you. The poultry vegetable rotation, you definitely would have to meet that manure waiting period between the application of the manure and the harvest of the crop. So if you wanted to run chickens in your hoop house in the winter and then plant a crop, you've got to be 90 or 120 days from when you take the chickens out to when you harvest. No question about it. Yeah? Could I just ask the folks who are speaking from the audience to speak up a little bit? We can't hear a thing back here. Thank you. I should be repeating those questions. Thanks a lot. So Nicholas, um, are you okay with that one? Can we move on? Yeah. Okay. The next one is temporary uh, hoop houses or caterpillar tunnels. Uh, how many people have built a caterpillar tunnel? Fewer numbers than I thought, and I did too. You got you, you using that? There they are. Well, what are the caterpillars? That, uh, somebody was referring to them. They're, they're very simple temporary structures to sort of um, reduce the cost of having a hoop house and very quick to build. You can build one in a matter of hours, measure it in hours instead of days. Drive rebar into the ground. Um, however, why do you want to make it? So I, I bought 20 foot pieces of um, PVC piping, put the, P, the rebar in the ground, take the PVC pipe, and go from one piece of rebar over to the other one. You've now made a hoop. And place them four feet apart, however long you want to make it, and then just put plastic over the top. And hold it down by putting rope over the plastic and putting stakes into the ground. Um, and somebody had it with zigzagging the rope around, I just had it going across. But generally you do the rope between the hoops and so it looks like a caterpillar. Can you picture it? And so you get really quick, you can build it in the spring as soon as you get started, you've got good cover for an early season tomato crop. Eric, there's one out here that's going to go here because the cover is not right now. The side curl is dead the whole the bottom of the and uh, it might look very efficient Yeah. <laughs> They're not meant to be left over the winter. This is a summer thing. You build it in April and take it, take it down in September. They have virtually no ability to withstand wind and certainly no snow. Gregory. That's what I was just yeah. about to say. Is that I'll say one thing about the know your wind. Our <laughs> site is a very windy site in the summer. And I put one of those up and I thought it was a great thing. And then the next thing you knew was all over the garden. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I but there. I would like to try to and that's right. Uh, who's here from Johnny's? Where is Paul? Yeah. Oh, there. Quick moves. You want to 
stand up and give us a question. The question was about quick loops. I forgot to repeat them already. What's the question? I couldn't hear it. Yeah, a little spiel about the quick loops that Johnny's are selling or how people can make their own. Well, we're, we're selling three different vendors. Um, there's a four foot vendor. Explain what a quick loop is first. Okay, a quick loop is a, is a hoop that's made out of uh, half inch EMG, okay, or PVC, okay. PVC will tend to not hold snow load as well. Um, the, the half inch EMG will do it better. It's, it's a little bit stronger, although we did have one, one guy here tonight who, who told me that he had, there he is, <laughs> Mark, um, said that uh, his, his hoop did collapse over the course of the winter. Um, we have run trials two years at the farm with these, and these are either four feet wide or the six feet wide. Okay. And um, the once the snow gets down around the, the hoops, and these are these are covered with with road cover and then uh, a, a four mil plastic, okay, ten feet wide. And we put sandbags down along the edges, and once the, the snow settles down around the sides of these, they're pretty much there for the winter unless you get too much. <laughs> but this is the first case that I've heard of was where the EMT actually collapsed. Yeah, we had one on our property we made with a uh, row cover rather than plastic. And it withstood the, the snow load fairly well. Uh, so what was the question about the quick loops? Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I was going to Oh, yeah. My, so my original question was not so much the little ones, but like uh, our mentor, Lazarus, Seth Crackman, he had the care center and the ER. They came out with a way to create a square tubing, and you could buy or make your own fender, and it was 17 foot wide. It did like a 17 foot by 200 foot long, and it used the, uh, what do you call those little quick latch? Like the yeah, 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 they used to have the ropes, the zigzags, and yeah. it's, you know, you can put it up in a day or two with a group. And was that meant to hold snow? No, but that okay. was my question, is like these these larger structures that are, is, what's, is, there, is there a benefit? I mean, is the cost of putting them up? Compared to a permanent? Yeah, because, yeah. you know, I'd love to have yeah, yeah, you guys, well, you guys don't have caterpillar tunnels. <coughs> One, I think the whole thing about the wind, we had this old design, maybe Tom knows where it came from. Actually, I think it was Johnny's first hoop house at the farm when I got there. And it was pretty light duty metal frame, one solid piece. And I could take a two by six, it was like 14 feet wide and spread it across and I could drag that thing wherever I wanted, 100 feet long. And uh, so I would do that. And one night, I, one afternoon, I dragged that over some brand new planted crops and I went out there and pounded rebar spikes all the way around that belly and I had ropes holding it down, and just like what you see with these caterpillars. And then I went to Home Depot to get the generator to power up the greenhouse all night because of the way they knock trees down for five miles in one direction from the farm. When I woke up the next morning, the thing was up in the trees. <laughs> Completely destroyed. And we took all the metal and used it as pipes for hanging tomatoes in our greenhouse. Um, but the, a temporary structure is probably free until it blows away. <laughs> And then you'll wish you had purchased the permanent one. <laughs> <laughs> Very good comment. Any other comments on the, the quick ones? Yeah. Well, not on quick ones, but on, on categories. That's what we're talking about. Mark, is that what was it? Yeah. Pretty much. Um, I just visited uh, Ted Longer's farm, Windflower Farm, in uh, upstate New York. Now, Ted has two banks and categories along with some large greenhouses also. Okay, and he's got some PVC caterpillars, and he's got some metal ones that are made from ripple hoops. 